Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Oscilloscopes Bandwidth. In this presentation, we'll provide a basic technical introduction to the concept of oscilloscope bandwidth, including how bandwidth is specified, why bandwidth is important, and how to determine the bandwidth required for a given measurement application. Fundamentally, bandwidth affects the accuracy of measured amplitudes. An ideal oscilloscope would provide an accurate measurement of amplitude, that is, voltage, regardless of the frequency of the signal. For example, if our input signal were a sinusoid with an amplitude of 1 volt peak to peak, an ideal oscilloscope would show a measured value of 1 volt peak to peak, regardless of the frequency of the sinusoid. All real oscilloscopes, on the other hand, attenuate the input signal differently at different frequencies. This is due to the characteristics of the components in the scope's front end, such as amplifiers and filters. These cause measured amplitude values to decrease as the input frequency increases. As shown in the graph, most scopes can measure amplitude fairly accurately up to a given frequency, after which the accuracy begins to decrease. The question therefore is, how do we specify or define this behavior? The bandwidth of an oscilloscope is defined as the frequency at which the measured amplitude of a sinusoidal input signal is decreased or attenuated by 3 dB. This is the same as an amplitude reduction of about 30%. Note that even at frequencies within the scope's nominal bandwidth, measured signal amplitude may still be lower than the actual amplitude. Also note that even at frequencies above or outside of the scope's bandwidth, measurements are still possible, although amplitude and accuracy might be quite high. Bandwidth is the most fundamental oscilloscope specification. It's specified in hertz, and modern digital oscilloscopes typically have bandwidths in the range of about 100 megahertz up to many gigahertz. The bandwidth of an oscilloscope must match the requirements of a given measurement application. That is, the scope must measure all of the important frequency components of a signal with sufficient accuracy. We'll discuss this in much more detail later in the presentation. If these components are outside of, or sometimes even just near, the scope's bandwidth, this can lead to several different issues. The most obvious of these is that the amplitude of the measured signal will be incorrect. Less obvious, but often more important issues, include distortion of the acquired waveform and the inability to make accurate rise time measurements. Let's start by looking at waveform distortion. If we're looking at a square wave signal and our scope has sufficient bandwidth, we should see a square wave signal on the scope display. But as we lower the bandwidth, the waveform begins to look less and less like a square wave. For example, here we can see that the corners begin to become more rounded. And if the bandwidth becomes low enough, our original square wave signal might even appear as a smooth sinusoid. In this example, we can also see how overall amplitude decreases as the bandwidth is decreased. This rounding of the edges of our square wave also leads to inaccurate rise time measurements. For example, let's look at a 10 MHz, 1V peak-to-peak square wave signal using an oscilloscope with a bandwidth of 100 MHz. We see a fairly sharp edge with a measured rise time of just under 9 nanoseconds and a measured peak-to-peak -peak voltage of just under 1 volt. If, however, we measure the same signal using a scope with a bandwidth of only 10 MHz, we can immediately see a difference in the waveform. Our measured value of rise time is now over 28 nanoseconds, and the measured peak-to-peak -peak voltage has decreased to only 854 millivolts. Later in this presentation, we'll discuss both why this difference occurs, and also how to choose an appropriate bandwidth for a given signal type. Selecting an appropriate bandwidth for analog signals is actually rather straightforward. A purely sinusoidal signal can be measured at frequencies up to, and even beyond, the scope's bandwidth. The shape of the waveform won't be significantly distorted, but the amplitude may be attenuated up to 3 dB as the bandwidth limit is approached, and will be attenuated even more once the bandwidth limit is crossed. For other analog signals, that is, signals without steep edges or sharp transitions, a bandwidth of three times the highest sine wave frequency is usually sufficient to avoid serious distortion. Using a bandwidth of 3x means our scope should be able to accurately measure the fundamental, second harmonic, and third harmonic. We'll talk more about harmonics on the next slide. This 3x rule also usually applies when decoding serial data signals, like UART, SPI, I squared C, etc. Although these protocols use square waves, the data rate is typically low enough that rounding of the corners will not affect the scope's ability to properly decode these signals. Let's contrast this with digital signals. 
When we talk about digital signals, we usually mean not just signals with a square or rectangular shape, but also signals that are high speed and or have sharp edges. These are extremely common in modern digital applications, and therefore it's important that we be able to measure them accurately. As you should already know, square wave signals are made up of the sum of odd harmonics, and the edges of our square wave become sharper or steeper as the number of odd harmonics increases. This is why we saw rounding of corners and decreased rise time when our bandwidth is lowered. The higher order harmonics that were needed to make the steep edges and sharp corners were falling outside of our scope's bandwidth, and their amplitudes were not being correctly measured. For digital applications, therefore, we normally want to choose a scope that has a bandwidth of three to five times the highest clock frequency. This ensures that we're accurately measuring the third and fifth harmonics. In most cases, this is sufficient for digital applications, although even higher order odd harmonics, like seventh and ninth, might be important for signals with very fast rise times. Keep in mind, however, that the amplitudes of harmonics decreases as their order increases, and in some scopes, the amplitude of these very high order harmonics might fall below the scope's noise floor and therefore be unmeasurable. Bandwidth is defined as the point where measured amplitude decreases by 3 dB, but this doesn't tell us anything about the shape or frequency response of the oscilloscope. In other words, how quickly does attenuation increase, both before and after we reach the bandwidth of the scope? Generally speaking, we can define the frequency response of oscilloscopes into two categories, Gaussian and a flat or brick wall response, although a scope's frequency response may fall somewhere between these two shapes. One reason why frequency response is important is that it affects signals whose frequency components fall beyond the 3 dB bandwidth. For example, the amount of ringing or overshoot on the signal will be different depending on the scope's frequency response, even if the bandwidth is the same. And as we'll see, the frequency response also affects the amount of noise in our measurements. Let's start by looking at the classical Gaussian frequency response. Almost all older analog scopes have a Gaussian frequency response, but Gaussian responses are also still used in some digital oscilloscopes today. The greatest advantage of a Gaussian frequency response is that it attenuates out-of-band signals less than a scope with a flat frequency response. Because these higher order frequency components are not as severely attenuated, better measurements of fast rise times are possible, and the amount of overshoot or ringing on square wave signals is also reduced. The greatest downside to a Gaussian frequency response is that this more gentle roll-off also allows more noise into the oscilloscope. Many digital oscilloscopes have a so-called flat or brick wall frequency response. There are several different ways to create this type of frequency response, for example using filters with Butterworth or Chebyshev responses. Regardless of the implementation, scopes with a flat frequency response usually attenuate the in-band signals less than those with a Gaussian response. In other words, there's very little attenuation until the 3 dB point is reached, after which amplitude falls off rather quickly. One advantage of this type of response is that it provides more accurate in-band amplitude measurements. However, note that the filter type may create some ripple in the passband and or irregularities at some frequencies. Another advantage of a flat frequency response is that it reduces the amount of out-of-band noise compared to a Gaussian response. The size of the gray shaded region in this illustration is substantially smaller than the corresponding region for a Gaussian response. One last point about frequency response. We've been showing our frequency response curves as being essentially flat in the passband, or the region below the 3 dB bandwidth frequency. However, the passband often is not completely flat, but may have various bumps or irregularities. We can quantify this using a term called magnitude frequency response, which is a measure of how much the actual passband deviates from an ideally flat passband. Typical values are about 1 half to 1 dB, although these values are not always specified by manufacturers. Some higher end oscilloscopes have a frequency response correction function that uses digital signal processing to smooth out the irregularities in the passband. The 3 to 5 times bandwidth rule is probably the most common way of calculating required bandwidth. For digital signals, rise time is another way to determine how much bandwidth is needed. Rise time, also sometimes called transition time or edge speed, is typically defined as the time that it takes for the signal to transition 
from 10% to 90% of the peak amplitude. Although you may come across situations where 20% and 80% values are used. As we discussed earlier, rise time is also a function of the higher order frequency components of a signal, typically the odd harmonics. In order to accurately measure signals with fast rise times, or sharper edges, our oscilloscope therefore needs greater bandwidth. The necessary bandwidth, therefore, can be calculated by multiplying the reciprocal of rise time by a scaling factor. This factor typically depends on the shape of the oscilloscope's frequency response. Typically, a factor of 0.35 is used for scopes with a Gaussian frequency response, and 0.40 to 0.45 is used for scopes with a flat frequency response. The higher value in this case is due to the need to accurately measure higher frequency content. In many cases, the precise value of this factor can be found in the oscilloscope specification or datasheet. One reason why rise time is useful is because it's a single number that incorporates the contribution of higher order harmonics. Although the 3 to 5 times bandwidth rule is much more straightforward, it does assume that we have knowledge of the frequency components of a signal. This is relatively easy to figure out for square or rectangular signals, but may not be as easy for more complex signals. So how do we determine the major frequency components of a complex signal? Although scopes are fundamentally time domain instruments, many modern scopes support frequency domain analysis by performing an FFT, or Fast Fourier Transform, on the acquired waveforms. The result is similar to what's seen on a spectrum analyzer, that is a plot of power versus frequency. This makes it very easy to quantify the frequency content, and therefore choose a bandwidth such that the important frequency components fall within the scope's bandwidth. Although clearly this is very useful when looking at digital signals, this methodology can also be used to analyze the frequency domain content of lower speed and analog signals as well. Up to this point, we've been talking exclusively about the bandwidth of the scope, but it's very important to remember that our measurement system actually consists of two parts, the oscilloscope itself, but also the probes and other cables, fixtures, and accessories. Each of these has its own bandwidth, and when we measure an input signal, the result displayed on our oscilloscope is actually a function of both probe and scope bandwidth, that is, the overall system bandwidth. A simple formula can be used to calculate the overall system bandwidth from the individual bandwidths of the scope and the probes. System bandwidth is an important concept because in some, or perhaps many cases, our measurement is limited not by the bandwidth of the scope, but by the overall system bandwidth. Just like oscilloscopes, probes have a bandwidth as part of their specification. When choosing a probe, a good rule of thumb is that the probe bandwidth should be at least 1.5 times the necessary scope bandwidth. That is, if we need 1 GHz of scope bandwidth for a given application, we should choose a probe with 1.5 GHz of bandwidth. And just like scopes, probes also have a bandwidth roll-off or frequency response. The reason, therefore, why we want a probe with wider bandwidth than the scope is that greater probe bandwidth means that more signal components will be in the flat frequency response region of the probe. In most cases, active probes are required for bandwidths of more than several hundred megahertz, although some passive probes can have bandwidths of up to a gigahertz or more. Throughout this presentation, we've seen how greater bandwidth is generally more desirable, particularly when looking at digital signals. But sometimes it can be advantageous to intentionally reduce a scope's bandwidth. This is usually a user configurable setting on the oscilloscope. One of the main reasons why we might want to reduce or limit the bandwidth of our scope is that this reduces high frequency noise and makes it easier to measure smaller signals. Limiting bandwidth is also helpful when we want to make measurements at the bandwidth specified for a given component. There are three ways of reducing or limiting bandwidth on modern digital oscilloscopes. The first two of these are analog filters and digital filters built into the scope itself. The third method is something called high definition mode, in which we reduce bandwidth in order to improve resolution or precision. Let's end with a brief summary. Bandwidth is one of, if not the most important, oscilloscope specification. It's defined as the frequency at which the measured signal is attenuated by 3 dB, or about 30%. In addition, the frequency response of the oscilloscope, that is, Gaussian versus flat, will also affect measurement results. It's very important to have sufficient bandwidth for the type of signal being measured, 
and the general rule is that scope bandwidth should be at least three to five times the highest frequency component. The rise time of a digital signal can also be used to determine the required scope bandwidth. And looking at the signal in the frequency domain using a scope's FFT function can help determine the highest frequency content of the signal. And finally, remember that the oscilloscope is one part of an overall measurement system, so the bandwidth of the probes used with the oscilloscope also plays an important role. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Oscilloscopes Bandwidth. If you'd like to learn more about oscilloscopes and other related topics, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.